On September 2nd, 2013, ESPN ran a story written by Tom Friend. And the first line read like this. Tommy Morrison died Sunday night of an undisclosed illness, but for all intents and purposes, he died of denial. Now maybe that doesn't mean much to many of you, but to me, an avid Rocky fan, I knew exactly who they were talking about. You see, Tommy Morrison is the person who played the part of Tommy Gunn in the movie Rocky V. Not a movie that critics loved, but I think had the best fight scene of all the Rockies. But he was more than an actor. He's actually a long-lost relative of John Wayne, had that same tough guy persona, but, but he was a boxer. In fact, when he was in eighth grade, his parents used to sign him up for tough man contests. I don't know if you know what that is, but that's basically a glorified bar fight where grown men fought for money, and he did well in eighth grade. He was an absolute physical specimen, muscle on top of muscle. He had a punch that contemporaries say rivaled Mike Tyson's. And he rose through the ranks quickly. In 1990, he starred in Rocky V. In 1993, he fought George Foreman and won the WBO heavyweight title of the world. He was an absolute physical specimen, as strong as a guy could be. But he was dying. In 1996, doctors told him he had contracted HIV. And in 1996, that wasn't a death sentence. In 1996, they had medication to treat it, but it meant his boxing career was over. It meant a lifetime of medication. It meant that even Tommy Morrison was human. And he wanted to hear it. He didn't want to hear from the doctors. He didn't want their medication. He took it for a month, he said, and he threw it away. He told everyone he was just going to live his life. And people reached out. Even Magic Johnson called him and told him, listen to the doctors, take the pills, it'll be okay, but he wouldn't do it. He went on living his life for a while. Ten years passed, and somehow he found him way, his way into a couple bouts, fought some MMA. But at some point, it, it finally caught up with him. This once absolute physical specimen was bedridden, couldn't walk across the room. And on September 1st, 2013, Tommy Morrison died at the age of 44. It's a tragic story because he was sick and there was treatment. He just didn't want to believe it. Jesus says in her sermon text, it's not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. If you look at Mark 2 and read through that account, it's not hard to find the sick. They're all around him. You've got thieving tax collectors and drunkards and prostitutes, all these people who had sinned and sinned in such obvious ways that their contemporaries put them in this group that they labeled as a quote-unquote sinners. The sick were everywhere. The question is, where are the healthy ones? We read from Mark chapter 2. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, he's right. The righteous don't need Jesus. They don't need the forgiveness he came to offer because if they truly were righteous by their own actions, they could stand on their own. But where are they? 
Because all around Jesus, you see people infected with the virus of sin, doing what sin always does, killing and destroying. And boy, could you see it in the people that gathered around Jesus. They had rushed off into open and obvious sin, from thieving tax collectors to thieves, to people who lost their livelihood in gambling, to drunkards and prostitutes. They flocked to Jesus because the evidence of their sin was all around them. Sin's fingerprints were all over their life, and it did what it always did. It were crisis and destruction. They knew they were sick. But it's not the devil's only ploy. You see, the devil's no one-trick pony. And sometimes, yeah, he comes at us in what you might call the devil with horns on. He just rushes you with open and obvious sin, just bull rushes you with a torrent of evil, and he appeals to all your most fleshly desires, tempts you to lose your temper, to say what you shouldn't say, to do what you shouldn't do, to indulge all your sinful appetites, to run off after lust. One after another, he takes this evil and he throws it in your face in wave after wave. And it is deadly. And it brings destruction. But it's not his only attack. You see, Jesus, he also warned us of wolves in sheep's clothing. And the devil, he likes that. You see, the devil in sheep's clothing, he looks to be almost exactly the opposite of the devil with horns on. Because he doesn't tell you to break all the rules. The devil in sheep's clothing loves rules. He watches as we show some self-control and some moderation, as we hold our tongue, as we don't lose our temper, as we keep some of those temptations at bay, and he pats us on the back for what good people we've been, but he's got an ulterior motive. He's weaving together this lie that maybe we don't need this gathering of sinners, that maybe we're not at the same place as those people that huddled around Jesus, that maybe we're not as sick as the Bible says. You can see them at the back of the room. There Jesus is, surrounded by these people caught in open and obvious sin, and there they are at the back of the room, the Pharisees, arms crossed, looking down in judgment upon what's happening there. And they were right. What in the world was a holy God doing with sinners? But where they were wrong is that they didn't realize they had the same problem. That just because they didn't sin in the same way didn't mean they didn't also sin. That just because they were better at hiding their sin doesn't make it less deadly. That just because their sin didn't carry with it the same consequences doesn't mean it wasn't destroying them too. They were sick. But they were like Tommy Morrison so impressed with their spiritual muscles that they didn't think there was anything they needed there. You know, sometimes Jesus finds us at our tax collector's booth, caught in scandal. Sometimes he finds us at the back of the room like the Pharisees, looking down in loveless judgment. And sometimes we're at both places in the same day. Sometimes we are just bull-rushed by the devil's evil and we give in to those sensual appetites and we chase off after that obvious evil and we do the things we know we shouldn't do that everyone knows we shouldn't do and it works destruction in our lives and the lives of our family, destroys our health, destroys our loved ones, destroys our livelihood. But there are other times where we walk the line, we follow all the rules, we hold our temper, we say the right thing, we do the right thing. And while that's good, there is a danger that we start to believe the devil's lie. That we're not like those other people. That we don't need this God of full and free forgiveness the same way other people do. That maybe there's nothing for us here in this gathering of sinners. And it is just as deadly and it works eternal destruction. 
But the difference is, like Tommy Morrison, we think we're so healthy that we don't have to worry about it. Can you hear Jesus' gentle rebuke in these words? It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Honestly, which one are we? Jesus has a way of finding us at the scene of the crime. I mean, Levi, of all the places to be found. I mean, he could have found Levi at the temple with an offering in hand, but he didn't. He could have found him at the synagogue on the Sabbath, listening to God's word, but he didn't. He finds him, of all places, at his tax collector's booth, the place where the Roman tyranny hit the people the hardest. You see, the Romans taxed people heavily, and the tax collectors took a little bit extra. Which means that if you couldn't pay your taxes and you lost your mule, if you couldn't pay your taxes and they took your family and took them to the salt mines, it was the face of a guy like Levi that you saw. See, the tax collector's booth is where the rubber of Roman tyranny hit the road. And how many Israelites just prayed and hoped that at some point God would be standing in front of that tax collector's booth. And at some point he would make them feel the pain they felt. Now it came. And there Jesus is. And he's standing in front of Levi. And you could imagine the collective hope of Israelites suffering just waiting for the judgment of God to come smashing down upon him. But it doesn't happen, does it? He doesn't have a word of condemnation or accusation. Jesus could see that Levi knew what he was. Sick. A sinner. Instead, he just has those simple words. Follow me. And then he goes to Levi's house and all these other people in the same predicament, they just flock towards him. And in the back of the room, there the Pharisees stand looking down in loveless judgment And Jesus speaks that verse. This gentle reminder that they too were sick. That they too needed a Savior because at the end of the day, he wanted them to follow him too. See, this is who our God is. He wants to be near us. Because if you love someone, that's how it works. You want to be close to them. But he's not just crossing his fingers and hoping somebody listens. That call has power. Just think of where he finds us. Sometimes he finds us lost in open and obvious sin. Other times he finds us in self-righteousness. But how different is it really? Doesn't he find us sick of life's broken promises? So sick of chasing all the wrong things, thinking that maybe we'll have some happiness and some joy and finding only destruction. Or so sick of following all the rules and realizing even then it's still not enough. But Jesus comes to us with promises that don't disappoint because he deals with our problems at their most basic level. He deals with our guilt and our sin and the sickness that is killing us. And he forgives it. He heals it. There's life there. And he gives us promises that don't disappoint. He finds us so alone. And sometimes we're alone because we broke all the rules and nobody wants to be around a guy like that. And other times we're alone because we kept all the rules, but we still have this nagging feeling it's not good enough. And then he takes us here with a whole bunch of other people in the same boat And he's near us. He comes to us in bread and wine, the Lord's Supper, and he offers us himself. He comes to us in the waters of baptism, comes to us in the power of his word as we listen to it, as we read it, as we sing it, and he draws us close. He finds us dying. Sometimes dying because we follow the devil into those horrible kinds of evil and it's just killing us. And other times dying because in all of our self-righteousness, we're never done. And he gives us life to just sit and listen to a God who loves us and forgives us. Life to know that right now, everything we do has meaning and purpose because it's all done to serve him. Life to know that we have a place with God forever in heaven. Follow me, he says. 
And this is where he brings us week after week. And it's not because a pastor always has all the right things to say, one or two words that helps you win the week on Monday. And it's not because your musicians always hit every single right note. And it's not because the guy next to you always has exactly the words to say. I mean, it's quite the opposite. Pastors stumble over their words. Musicians hit a few wrong notes, and maybe the guy sitting next to you singing hasn't hit a right note yet. But Jesus is here in word and sacrament, dealing with the virus of sin, forgiving and healing. This is exactly where we need to be. Amen.